Hello and welcome to notes for module 3.1. You're going to turn to page 115 in your textbook and as you're getting there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of introductory information. Um, today we're going to be talking about the same kinds of transformations that we have already done in the past. We've talked about translations, which are basically slides of a figure. We have talked about uh, reflections, which are a flipped version of a figure. And we've talked about rotations, which are a spin of an original figure. All of these transformations produce congruent figures, which just end up in a different place somewhere on your grid. Um, you can see the module title or the unit title is congruent figures here. So even though we're still talking about the same kinds of transformations we have already done, our emphasis is going to be slightly different. Our emphasis is not going to be on what is a translation and how to do it or what is a rotation or what is a reflection, but instead we're going to be focusing on the fact that doing these transformations, even if you do multiple ones of them at the same time, produce congruent figures uh, instead of figures that are different. So on 115, we're going to be talking about sequences of transformations. And as you can see in the essential question at the top, it just asks what happens when you apply more than one transformation to a figure. Um, when we're talking about transformations, primarily, again, the three that we have already discussed are translations, and reflections and rotations. Translation and reflection and rotation are what we call isometric. Isometric means that it produces a congruent figure uh, or a figure that's identical to the one that you started with. So we're going to write produces or makes a congruent figure. I use the symbol for congruent. We have symbols so that we can use them. Uh, but you, if you want to write out the word, feel free. So isometric, once again, means that we produce a congruent figure when we perform a translation or when we perform a reflection or when we perform a rotation. So if it doesn't change the figure, that means that all of the angles say the same measure, preserves angle measure. Uh, it also preserves line length. We can just put length. Um, some of them even preserve which direction it faces, uh, like which direction is up, for example. That's called orientation. But isometric definitely prefers, uh, preserves line length, it preserves angle measure, and also preserves what's called betweenness, B-E-T-W, betweenness. That just means if you have a line and you have points A and B and C in that order, it's not going to rearrange them and suddenly make it A, C, B. It's going to be in the same order that it started. And then we're going to put sometimes orientation. So isometric figures always preserve angle measure. Isometric figures always preserve length of lines. Isometric figures always preserve betweenness and isometric uh, transformations sometimes preserve orientation, but sometimes they don't. For example, a translation would keep this, the figure facing the same way up, but a rotation would not. So sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't preserve orientation. So after that little bit of information, um, we need to talk about some kinds of transformations that are not isometric. So we have translation and reflection and rotation that produce figures that are congruent. But then we also have up here, I'm just going to write it up here in a different spot, a dilation. A dilation is not isometric. A dilation is a transformation that changes everything according to a common scale factor. So if you double all of the line lengths, for example, or if you cut them in half, a dilation is not isometric. Um, it uses a scale factor to change the figure's size. 
uses a scale factor to change size. Okay, so some of the sequences that you might see could be dilations. Dilations multiply your X and your Y coordinates by the same number. And those would not produce congruent figures because dilations are not isometric. But all of the three that we already know about, they are isometric. They do produce congruent figures. And so we can stack those transformations on top of each other and still be assured that our figure is the same as when we started. So let's look at some examples. Let's look on 117 at number seven. For number seven, we're going to do two different transformations. The first one is a reflection across line L. And our second one is then a 90 degree rotation around point P. So a reflection across line L would be pretty easy to just draw out and see because line L is a vertical line right here. And so we know that point B is going to have to travel in a line that's perpendicular to line L. So it's going to have to travel along this line. Um, a perpendicular line uh, to a, this one is vertical, so a horizontal line would be perpendicular to that. And it also has to be the same distance on one side as the other. So if this is one unit away, then B prime is also going to be one unit away. A and C are conveniently collinear. They're on the same line. So now we just need to place A and C the same distance from line L. So if C is one unit away on the left, C prime is going to be one unit away on the right. If A prime is one, two, three units away on the left, A prime has to be one, two, three units away on the right. Please remember the little prime markings. Those are the apostrophes behind the letters. They indicate that a change has been performed. So this was our first change. There is one mark. It is A prime, B prime, and C prime. But there are two changes that we have to do. So our second change is a 90 degree rotation around point P. So a rotation always follows the pattern YX, XY, YX, negative first, negative both, negative last. We make those into points. And these are 90, 180, and 270 going down on the left. And then up on the right, 90, 180, and 270. The left side spins left, the right side spins right, and that's how we do all of our rotations. So what we need to do then is we need to figure out some coordinates. We don't actually have a true coordinate plane because we don't have our x and y axes labeled here, but what we can do is we can make up some coordinates. We typically rotate points around zero, zero. So I'm going to make our center of rotation, point P, a temporary zero, zero. I hope you remember doing this from a previous chapter. Um, we have actually done all of these things. So if this all seems very familiar, that's good. It should. It's really just a review. So we've made these temporary X and Y axis, and we're going to now move A prime, B prime, and C prime because we want to do this reflection, then do a rotation. So we have done the first step, and now we change this triangle to make our second step. So I'm gonna look at my coordinates for A prime. We have one, two, three, four, five comma one is where A prime appears to be. Um, C prime was at three comma one, and then B prime is at three, comma four. And I just counted that out. You could see me counting. Then I need to find the rule that I use to rotate. A 90 degree rotation, if it doesn't say a direction, then your direction is counterclockwise. That would be this rule. 90 degrees counterclockwise is negative y comma x. So what we said was we're going to turn a prime into a double prime by turning my x y ordered pair into negative y comma x instead. This means we switch the order 
and change the sign on the new front number. So we first switch the order, five one becomes one five, and then we change the sign on the new front number. So positive one turns into negative one. Repeat, um, B is at four, I don't think that's right, one, two, three, is it three comma four? Glad I caught that. Three comma four becomes four comma three because we switch the order. And then the new front number becomes negative. So now this is negative four comma three. C prime was at three one. So we're gonna use one three and change the front number's sign. So now it's negative one three. Our rotation is now performed. All we have to do is plot. So we're going to plot A double prime at negative one comma five. And this is again A double prime. It's double prime because we have done two transformations to point A. It started here, first we translated, then we rotated. Point B prime, or B double prime rather, is at negative four comma three. So negative one, two, three, four, one, two, three, B double prime. And C double prime is at negative one comma three, just like this, C double prime. Connect our figures, and here we go. I usually shade in the last one if we're working on paper, just because if you're doing sequences of transformations, you should have the same figure drawn multiple times on the same graph. So if you were to examine these, because we did a reflection and because we did a rotation, and rotations and reflections keep all the same angle measures, they keep all the same side lengths, they keep betweenness, then all three of these triangles should be congruent with each other because reflections produce congruent figures and rotations produce congruent figures. Another example, we can translate along vector V. That would be our first transformation. And then a 180 degree rotation around point P then a third one, translating along vector u. So we're doing three things this time. But because we're translating, rotating, translating, and because translations and rotations produce congruent figures, then the figure that we end up with should be congruent in all of its measurements to our original triangle EFG. So first we translate along vector v. Vector v moves our coordinates or moves our points up one and right two. So up one and right two puts E prime right there. Up one and right two puts G prime there. And then F prime up one and right two goes right there. Easy enough. Next, we do a 180 degree rotation. We want to make sure we do these in the right order, as tempting as it would be to go ahead and do both vectors at the same time. That's not the order that's listed. First, we do vector B, and then we do a 180 degree rotation. So, for a 180 degree rotation, we need to make point P right here our zero, zero. We need to make it our origin. And we need to figure out our coordinates for E prime, F prime, and G prime based on a zero, zero that's right here. So E prime is at negative one, three. F prime is at positive one, positive one. And G prime is at negative two, positive two. Since we are now moving the second time, E prime is going to turn into E double prime. F prime is gonna turn into F double prime and G prime is gonna turn into G double prime because this is again the second transformation that we have done to points E, F, and G. 180 degree rotation. If I've already got this listed out, I don't necessarily have to do it again. 180 degrees counterclockwise is negative X comma negative Y. So we're gonna leave the X and Y in the right order, but we're gonna change the sign on each one. So that's what we're gonna do down here. For E double prime, negative one, positive three, 
stays in that order, but I want to change both of the signs. So now this is positive one, negative three. For F prime at one, one, when I change both of the signs, it becomes negative one, negative one. For G prime, I started G prime at negative two comma two, and my rule tells me to change both of the signs, so it's now positive two, negative two. And then we plot those points. So again, if P is zero, zero, E double prime needs to go right one, and then down three, E double prime. Label it on your graph. F double prime is at negative one, negative one. Again, label it F double prime. G double prime is at two, negative two. So G double prime. If you were to measure and calculate, you would find that all three of these triangles have the same line lengths, they have the same angle measures, um, they preserve betweenness because translations and rotations are isometric. We have one more translation to do. We need to translate this along vector u. Vector u is down here. Vector u takes our initial point and it moves it one, two, three spaces to the left. So we're going to take all of these and we're going to move them three spaces to the left. So F triple prime goes right there, three spaces away from F double prime. E is going to move one, two, three spaces and become E triple prime. G double prime is going to move one, two, three spaces and become G triple prime. And I know it's really awkward looking to write triple prime and uh, to keep stacking those apostrophes out there, but you can stack those as many deep as you need to. We did three transformations. We have three prime marks back there. That should always match. So F triple prime, E triple prime, and G triple prime indicates that we have done three transformations to our original points E and F and G. On the next page, page 118, um, you begin to get introduced to some transformations that are not isometric. Another way that you might hear them described or see them described is non-rigid. Rigid motions keep figures congruent. Non-rigid motions do not keep figures congruent. So you can see in this first example, this is a dilation. We know it's a dilation because you have multiplied the x and the y by the same number. Only multiply, same number on both. That's what makes a dilation. Um, you can multiply by other things and have transformations that are still not rigid, but also not dilations. Um, so don't try, to, don't try to pack this into a box that it doesn't necessarily fit into. So take a look down here at B. I've multiplied the x by three but not the y by three. This is not a dilation, but it's also not a translation. It's not a rotation. It's not a reflection. It's just a general transformation of a figure. So it's not one of our special kinds that has a name, but it does change the figure in some way. So it is a transformation of some type. So what we do, what this tells us is we start with our original points one by one, and then we change the x's by a factor of three, and we leave the y's alone. Then after that, we're going to multiply by one half on our x's and by negative one half on our y's. Now, personally, I don't like to do these kinds of problems on a graph. I like to have the numbers because if I'm just going to multiply, that's not something that I can just like count up and down and left and right. I mean, you could, but it's a whole lot easier for me to just look at this number and say, oh, this is negative two, okay, negative two times three, for example. So what I'm gonna do to make this easier on myself is I'm gonna go ahead and write A and B and C coordinates. So A is at zero, negative two. B is at negative two, negative four. 
C is at negative four, negative four. Then these are our X comma Y numbers. X comma Y turns into three X comma Y. So all of my X numbers get multiplied by three. So let's do that. A prime, B prime and C prime will be the results. Three times zero is zero. The Y value stays the same. Three times negative two is negative six. The Y value stays the same. Negative four times three is negative 12. The Y value stays the same. And that's your transformation. You could draw it out if you wanted to, but I'm gonna go ahead and perform this other calculation as well and turn A prime, B prime, and C prime into A double prime, B double prime, and C double prime. And again, it's double prime because I've done one, two different transformations. Now I'm gonna take all of my X's and multiply them times one half, and all of my Y's times negative one half. So I'm actually gonna do all of the X's first, then I'm gonna go back and do all of the Y's, just to kind of keep things organized. So zero times one half is of course zero. Negative six times one half is negative three. Negative 12 times one half is negative six. Then we do our Y values. Our Y values get multiplied by negative one half. So negative two times negative one half is positive one. Negative four times negative one half is positive two. And once again, negative four times negative one half, again, positive two. This is your final set of coordinates because you have done both of these transformations. You've literally just followed the order, followed the rule that's written out here for you. And so you can now plot these over on the graph. So A is at zero, one, and this is now A double prime. Negative three comma two is where we find B double prime. And then negative six comma two is where we find C double prime. So there we go. Now, these figures are not the same size. These are not translations, they are not reflections, they are not rotations. Translations, reflections, and rotations are the only isometric, also called rigid motions. Those are the only ones that produce congruent figures. Since we have multiplied anywhere, even just one place, we do not have congruent figures any longer. We actually multiplied in, a, in multiple places, uh, but all it takes is just one instance of multiplication to distort your figure um, and make it non-congruent. Let's do another example. We have uh, X comma Y turning into X minus one, Y minus one. Well, that just is a slide. This is a translation. The translation goes left one and down one of all of these points. Then we have this. This is a transformation that doesn't have a name. It's not truly a dilation because it doesn't have a three and a three with your X and your Y, uh, but it does change our figure because we're multiplying here. And then we have negative X, negative Y. This is a 180 degree rotation around the origin or around zero, zero. So you have uh, a translation, you have a rotation, and then you have just a general transformation without a name. So if we don't have a, a set of transformations that are all isometric, we will not end up with congruent figures because this one transformation in here produces non-congruent figures, then that is what characterizes our entire set of transformations. So let's tra take triangle ABC. To me, it's easier to do a translation on the graph. So I'm gonna go take my X's and go left one, and then I'm gonna go down one. So left one and down one puts A prime right there. It puts C prime right there, and it puts B prime right there. Easy enough. 
work smarter, not harder. If you would rather uh, list them out and do the subtraction, that's fine. But to me, this was faster. So next, I need to multiply all of the X's times three. This one is the one that I like to write it out for. So A prime and B prime and C prime. A prime is at one, one. And I need to multiply my X's by three. So three comma one. Because this three times this one makes this three. B is at one comma, neg one comma to four, sorry. So when I multiply one times this three, it's just gonna be three comma four. Lastly, C is at two comma one. So when I turn that into C double prime, I'm gonna multiply it times three. So two times three is six, and the one stays the same. Then we have negative X comma negative Y. Um, negative, actually, let me go ahead and graph this just so you can see what it looks like. So these I'm gonna do in a different color just to show you what it's, gonna, what it's gonna look like and how it changes your shape. So if A double prime is at three, one, B double prime is at three, four, and C double prime is at six, one, your resulting triangle looks like this. So let's take a minute and examine what has changed here. The height is still the same. That makes sense because nothing changed with our Y numbers. Our X numbers increased by a factor of three. So what we would expect to see is that the side to side lengths are gonna get multiplied times three as well. Let's see if that's what happened. A prime C prime used to be one unit long and now we are three units long over here. So that's exactly what happened. When you multiplied the X number by three, the horizontal lengths increased by a factor of three as well. And you can see clearly these are not congruent figures any longer. Finally, we're gonna do X, uh, negative X comma negative Y. So I'm gonna do that down here. A triple prime, B triple prime, C triple prime to go ahead and set that up. I'm just gonna change both of my signs. So three one becomes negative three, negative one. Three four becomes negative three, negative four. Six one becomes negative six, negative one. And then we can plot those. So negative three, negative one for A triple prime. Negative three, negative four for B triple prime. C is at negative six, negative one for C triple prime. This is our final destination right here. We have done all three. There's our original one, two, three transformations. So we should see three apostrophes. We do A triple prime, B triple prime, C triple prime. And we should have a couple of pairs of congruent figures in this, in this setup but not all of the figures will be congruent to the original. Wherever we did this transformation, these two figures would be isometric, also called congruent. And then later, these two figures would be congruent or isometric. But because we changed with multiplication in this step, going from transformation number one to transformation number two, this is where we see our shape become non-congruent. You can see that here. This was our pre-image in the gray. We moved it left one and down one, and it stayed the same, they're congruent. Then we multiplied our X's, and that's where our figure became not congruent with its, with its uh, last version. However, on our next one, we just performed a rotation. So that rotation does produce a figure congruent to the one before it. So our final result, our pink triangle, is the same as this one. Um, that, in a nutshell, is sequences of transformations with more examples than you probably needed. Um, sequences of transformations involve doing the exact same things that we had been doing before for translations, for rotations, and for reflections. The only thing that is new here is that now you're stacking them up 
And instead of doing them one at a time, we can do two or three or four, or however many we need to. Um, additional new concepts include multiplying one or both of your X and Y coordinates, but this is the same coordinate notation uh, that you've been using since the first time that we ever did translations. So you should be familiar and comfortable with taking this X comma Y and then doing some math to it. Instead of X minus one, it's just times three in this case. Over here it would be times three over two and times negative two. Um, and it's the same formula, right? It's a little formula or a recipe or a set of instructions on how to change your coordinates. Lastly, some new information, new terms really. Uh, we know about congruence. We know that congruence means that the angles are the same and the lengths are the same and the betweenness is the same. Uh, but we got a new word for that and that word is isometric. Isometric refers to a transformation such as a translation, reflection, or rotation that produces a congruent figure. These three are the only isometric transformations. Others are not. Some of them are named like a dilation, which is where you multiply both the X and the Y by a common scale factor, but others, they just don't have names. They're not isometric, but they're not dilations either. They're just kind of in that bigger category of transformations or things that change a shape. Some examples would be this one where you multiply, but not by the same number, or maybe you only multiply one coordinate and not both. These would be examples of uh, non-rigid motions. They are not isometric. They do not produce congruent figures, but they also don't have a name. You have some assignments in IXL that deal with sequences of transformations. Um, I would strongly encourage you to use your notes, not necessarily even from 3.1, but from previous sections where we covered transformations one by one. Those notes would prove to be pretty helpful. And as always, if you have questions, please email.